Hello, everyone. I'm Terry Elton. I'm Dwight Shiley. And I'm Alicia Granholm. Welcome to the Pivot Podcast. If you are new here, this is the podcast where we talk about how the church can faithfully navigate a changing world. Today's episode will be a Q&A session. We'll give insight to questions frequently asked of us and our team at Luther Seminary's Faith Lead that have come from participants in Faith Lead offerings and from our engagement with leaders in a variety of contexts around the church. So let's jump in. All right, question one. I'm burned out and exhausted. Is it time to call it quits? Dwight and Terry. Yes to the first part. First of all, I just want to say this is a real question. And I think this question was real before the pandemic. And then the pandemic just accelerated this. And I will say I've asked this more than once. Um, I want to speak. I want to be the first to just offer an answer through a personal story. So I have a little church gig on the side in addition to my being at seminary. So I'm a pastor. And I get how tiring it is and how you got to be on all the time. And I used to think that if I could just manage my calendar better, that would be the magic bullet. And really what came to me was starting to come to me before the pandemic, but really after was like, this is actually a spiritual issue. And here's what I mean by that. I was pouring out, right? A lot of, and I was managing conflict as a leader, as a, per, as a spiritual leader, like walking with people in hard times. And I wasn't filling my own cup. I wasn't taking time for me. Uh, I'm a mom. I'm a, I'm a spouse. I'm a, I care for my parents in various ways. And I wasn't doing my own work in that area or taking time for that or prioritizing, I guess is what I would say. I felt like it was a luxury. And during the pandemic, when we all shut down and I wasn't commuting and I wasn't, I really said, I got to get some practices in place. And I would say for me, the biggest challenge coming back into the, all this stuff has been keeping those practices in my life and letting them, when I'm feeling burnt out or exhausted or it's like the time to quit, I'm like, huh, funny thing. I haven't been doing those practices. So I, I just, I offer that. I don't think that's everybody's answer. I think there are, it's way more complicated than that. But that was a really turn for me to say, I think this is first and foremost a spiritual issue. And are you feeding that? You know, Terry, that reminds me of something that our former colleague, Pat Kieferd, who taught um, systematic theology here at Luther for many years, he and his um, organization, Church Innovations Institute, in their work with pastors around the world in a lot of different contexts, 85% of the pastors that they worked with over the years, for many years, um, had no functioning spiritual practices in their own lives. In other words, if they were reading the Bible, it's because they were preparing for a sermon, or if they were praying, they were praying at a bedside or something like that. And so I just want to name um, how deep of a challenge this is. And, um, and how, so if you, if you, the listener, are, are feeling that, maybe even feeling some shame about that, um, you're not alone. I mean, this is, um, it's a deep challenge. And partly, you know, this question that you're asking, Alicia, is has to do with, I think, the acceleration that's going on in how life is lived in Western societies mm -hmm. and um, the, the way in which time functions differently. And so much more is crammed in, uh, the way technology plays into that. And so, um, so taking the time to do spiritual practices is, um, can feel like it's the first thing to get squeezed out of the day. Um, particularly when you're trying to sustain a model of church with fewer volunteer resources, maybe a smaller staff, if you have a staff in your context. And so it's easy for more and more just to fall on one's own shoulders. I was thinking too about <clears throat> early in the pandemic, along with, um, yes, the need, obviously, to continue to either continue in you know, our own spiritual practices that are life-giving or find new ones because it's a new and different season. And so what we've done historically in our relationship with God, we might find that, gosh, I'm still doing that, but I just am so dry spiritually. Well, maybe it's time for a different spiritual practice. And there's there's so many really that, that we can um, engage, that we can find life-giving. And I remember another thing too that I 
uh, that we saw happening um, in the summer of 2020 um, that I think fits with this question as well, because um, we did see a lot of people leaving ministry that summer. And one of the things that became apparent to me was that um, because people were invited to literally do ministry differently, there was this... um, And their identity was really tied up in what they were doing and not necessarily why they were doing it and why they had been called into ministry, that when the attachment is to the thing that we do and not why we're doing it, it's a lot easier than when things change because they always do. Uh, Nothing is constant except change. Um, Is that when our identity is tied up in what we're doing, it's so much easier for us to get burned out and overwhelmed um, because we're not rooted in our why. And and maybe we weren't to begin with, and that's okay. Um, But I think a lot of times when we do make space to step back and really reevaluate, okay, is it, am I still called to this? And if so, and I can, you know, answer yes, and that might be after a week of a break or a Sabbath um, or a sabbatical, um, then great, how can I do that moving forward? And maybe we realize, no, actually, I'm being called into a new season and being called to do something different. And so maybe it is time to look for something else. But I think really getting back to our actual why can help inform whether or not we <clears throat> should lean into it or are being called to a new assignment. I wonder if I can just connect that. I think it's so helpful to um, thinking about the why for church, right? And I think often the personal burnout that leaders experience has to do with trying to sustain a particular model of church that isn't itself clear on the why. You know, why are we, what are we doing these things for? And so many activities in churches and programs may have um, developed over the years that at one point might have meaningfully connected people to God, each other, and their neighbors, but they don't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. And yet we still feel like we can't give them up or we need to keep them going. There's very little energy in them. Um, And so this is just a moment when I think the churches that thrive are going to be clear about their why. Mm -hmm. And the foundation of that has got to be following Jesus, Mm -hmm. discipleship, making disciples, helping people um, live as disciples of Jesus in a cultural context in society that uh, makes that difficult, that doesn't support that and distracts us from that in all kinds of ways and thwarts that in all kinds of ways. And so that intentionality that you're describing of personal vocation then is an opportunity to help a community also discern or clarify its own why. Um, And really, ultimately, that's about why the gospel, right? (laughs) Why Jesus, not just why the institutional church. Exactly, yeah. I just want to, it's really easy for us to, to take this out of a context and people's story and make it sound like, yeah, just do this and it'll be taken care of. It's not ever that simple. And so part of, I guess, what I would like listeners to know is if you're feeling that, reach out to somebody. I started doing spiritual direction, luckily, right before the pandemic. And then my daughter was diagnosed with breast cancer. And boy, was I glad I had somebody that was walk, you know, I had other tools that I needed to to do as well. But I think there may be a season, there may be something that's going on in your congregation or ministry that is making this super hard. And and who can you reach out to to help get you perspective, help find the resources? Because my sense is this, we wait too long to ask and then we're over the hump of the burnout or, or that. So the sooner we can reach out or even get some space to deal with whatever's in front of us, the more apt we are to be able to ask the why for ourselves and to say, hey, what the church needs is not me. That may be what is going on here, or Mm -hmm. I just have to have space to deal with what's going on. Those are real, but I also think there may just need to be processing and some resources to get you through. Mm -hmm. So those of you who have not listened to episode 50, of this Pivot Podcast with George Acevedo. That's another episode that digs into this very question um, with some really rich discussion and insight.
Are you navigating the ever-evolving wilderness of church and culture? Well, you are not alone on this journey. Faith Lead has walked alongside thousands of church leaders, drawing valuable lessons from the many challenges they have faced. Our upcoming video series, How to Take Your Next Faithful Step, draws on these insights from real-life ministry. Whether you're grappling with issues like dwindling church participation, volunteer involvement, or maintaining congregational connection and activity, join Dr. Alicia Granholm, Senior Director at Faith Lead, for an engaging four-part video series. After each video, participate in an interactive Q&A where you can share your perspectives and connect with fellow ministry leaders, learners, and volunteers. You'll explore the six essential theological commitments, discover the five core tasks of ministry, and hear more about the four key pivots to navigate a faithful future in ministry. Are you ready to join this interactive experience? Sign up now to take part. Turn ministry challenges into opportunities for growth and connect with a community dedicated to taking their next faithful step to follow God into a hopeful future. All right, are we ready for question two? Ready. All right. So, help. My congregation is tired and lacking energy. What can I do to fix it? Have you heard that one? Yes. <laughs> so often, so Absolutely. often. You know, and I think I want to just, I want to end with that second to last word in the question, which is fix. <laughs> and so I think so often when we hear this, um, our impulse is to try to fix it. And I think, um, I think the, the tiredness and lack of energy is often actually a theological and spiritual challenge that can't be fixed. So it's, it's not about how do we just sort of maybe restructure our committees or our meetings so that people are more energized and that may be good to do. <laughs> Those fixes are always important, um, but there's usually something deeper that's actually going on here. So I wanna, I wanna think a little bit about where does the energy come from in your church's life? And I know um, it's tempting for leaders to feel like they need to bring the energy mm -hmm. to catalyze people to invest their time, talent, and treasure in this voluntary association congregation to show up at programs to in worship and to you know serve on committees and ministries and all of that. And that also leads to burnout and exhaustion, right? Because that is a very heavy burden to carry. And I don't think it's one that God really wants um, from us, mm -hmm. um, rather than actually understanding that the energy in the church comes from the Holy Spirit. So let's if we can just theologically pause for a moment on that idea. Um, one of the ways to identify the Spirit's movement is in life-giving energy that creates connections of love. That's how the Holy Spirit shows up so often. And um, and so, so I, I'm always curious for congregations that are experiencing this tiredness and lack of energy, where is the Holy Spirit at work in the life of your church? Um, how do you talk about that? How do you pay attention to that? How do you discuss it? How do you reflect on it together as a community? Um, the congregation that my wife and I served in St. Paul for, for many years, um, we, we helped over the course of these many years, that congregation began to, to get comfortable with naming that. And so people would use that language. They would say, gosh, it, it feels like the Spirit is moving in this ministry, in this time. And what we did was, um, we also put a bunch of ministries on sabbatical or hiatus <laughs> that didn't seem to have a lot of life-giving energy in them, where people were tired. And we said, you know what, let's just not have that committee meet for a while and see if we miss it. And let's lean into where people are feeling energy and connection and um, rather than trying to sustain these other things. You know, I can't help but think about <clears throat> um, as a mom of two young boys, they're almost seven and almost four. And, um, you know, if I ask them to do something that they're just, they don't have to hate it. They just don't even like it. They're instantly tired and they will fall on the floor and suddenly their legs don't work. They cannot walk. They cannot move. They're like, I just, I'm too tired. They're literally, and that is the exact words coming out of their mouth. They're like, oh, I'm just so tired. 
And then you mentioned donuts or like their favorite podcast or, uh, you know, if they want to watch Bluey or something else. And suddenly they are revived. It's like they have come back from the dead. And so, you know, I do think um, just like practically what does it look like for um, for our congregations and our people to be tired is, is very much uh, what it looks like for when we ask children to do things they just don't want to do or they don't find life giving in the way that that they might not be opposed to it. It just it doesn't bring them energy and life. And so, yes, they're going to be tired and they're not going to have time for it. Um, but when we when we are discerning together what the Holy Spirit is up to, there will be those bright spots and those places where, oh, huh, maybe this is something this Holy Spirit is doing within us because suddenly there is energy there. And it really is as if, you know, they come back to life. Um and it, it's not, you know, one of the one of the the things that we've seen with um, churches, you know, especially coming into the pandemic and um, not necessarily, you know, even coming out of it is that people were so busy. Mm-hmm. And so that absolutely has fed into the tiredness and the exhaustion. Um, and um, we're seeing that a lot of congregations are starting to pick up things that were, had been dropped during the pandemic and that there's a bit of a return to the pace at which things were before. And, um, and you know, we just know that people are tired. We can't sustain that. We can't sustain um, all the programs and ministries in the way that um, our congregations once could. Um, but there is life to be had there and there is hope and energy still. And um, I just I appreciate, Dwight, just the... Um, examples of ways that we can kind of refine that the life-giving things within our congregations again. I know for me when I don't have energy, it's one, I'm just doing too many things. B, I'm doing things that aren't in my gift set or don't bring me passion. Or maybe I'm fighting. Like maybe I love it, but I'm fighting something like that. So part of what I wonder, and this kind of is like, you can't fix it really easily, but you can be curious Right. So so you take a hi- hiatus, you, you lean back and then you say, which of the why? Why is the source of the energy not there? Right. Mm-hmm. It's because we're trying to do Sunday school and there's no kids or there's very few or they don't want Sunday school. Mm-hmm. Why are we trying to do Sunday school? Right. Um, but boy, we have a really active group of young senior adults that really are energetic and have time and want to do some things together and want to serve in the community. What if we leaned into that? So I think part of it is the opportunity to say, just like in our own lives, when we're tired and lacking of energy, what is that about? Right. Maybe you do have to teach your kids to do certain things, but there's other things you're like, if you hate swimming lessons, let's just stop do swimming lessons. Right. And I think we think there's a a model of church we have to do. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so much permission to say, let's quit doing it. I had a conversation with a bishop this week that said, we're trying to get our smaller congregations to do worship and one other thing. What's one other passion area you have? And maybe that's enough. And I just, I liked that freedom that came with. And he said, what's funny is they end up doing more usually, but it's the reframing of the conversation that has been helpful. Yeah. So in this um, podcast series, we're talking about the pivot from kind of one model or one shapes fits all, one size fits all of church to a mixed ecology of lots of different ways to embody Christian community in our context today. And I think, Terry, that's a really great invitation for us. If we've inherited a model of ministry that was really birthed in and designed for a different period of time, I mean, I can't tell you how many of my students have uh, studied um, congregations that were post-World War II, often first-ring suburban congregations. And there's is such a common narrative, so many of these churches in so many places where they, they built the big Sunday school wing and all of that, and it's mostly empty now, and the congregation is aging, and they still have this expectation it needs to look like it did. Um, so we want to encourage you to seek God's permission and God's leading to release what isn't actually meaningfully connecting with people and to lean into 
what is, even if that might look very different than what people have experienced before or have expected um, in terms of, of how the church uh, does its thing. And so, um, so the energy of the Holy Spirit is, you know, abundant, right? Theologically, we believe that, we experience that, and is not constrained by boxes <laughs> that we try to put God in, right? This is one of the classic themes in the biblical literature, of form of idolatry, right? Of trying to kind of manage and contain and, um, and box in God. And um, so I just think the posture of curiosity of, you know, where are people feeling um, energy in their lives? And then if they're just generally exhausted all across their life because modern life in America and Western societies is just so crazily fast and overscheduled or whatever whatever that looks like, then the great spiritual intervention in that in following Jesus is to say, okay, well, how might we actually intentionally do things differently? And I'm really curious about... Um, you know, some of the, the things like micro communities that are emerging um, across the landscape of the church in North America and other forms of church that are intentionally very simple, not programmatic, mm -hmm. very local with the neighborhoods so people aren't driving hour, you know, mm -hmm. each week to to and from church activities, not heavily institutionalized, but are actually um, cultivating really powerful transformational relationships in the neighborhood with people and between people and God. So our next question. So if I'm not preaching and teaching and doing everything, then who am I as a pastor? If I'm not at the center of things, I don't feel like I'm doing my job. That is something we hear and we know that many um, pastors struggle with. So what do we do about that? Well, Terry, I'm curious how you would answer this because you don't fit into uh, <laughs> into that box as a pastor. Speaking of boxes. Yes. Anyway. So here's a little story. I was actually just thinking that, Alicia, thanks for that little thing. Um, so I do online worship, and uh, I'm mostly the host. I don't preach as much. I teach periodically, mostly online. And... And so then I'm tending these relationships of people that are coming online. And th so here's really funny. So that's my one little part that I'm supposed to do. And then I get a new member and working with a woman that's organizing, like, the visits to shut-ins and people that are, can't get out in very, for various reasons, um, health and otherwise. And she says, yeah, Bev is going to start visiting this person online. I wonder if you could, you know, give her some ideas. So like, here's my one little caregiver that a caregiving relationship I'm supposed to do. And I thought, this is awesome. We now have two people from the congregation that are both retired, have time, and they're hanging out with Judy and they're checking in. And I'm like, okay, here's my little thing. So we have this little conversation. And and I had an opportunity um, with somebody else to do something around Christmas and to empower somebody else. And, and I, I called my husband as I was driving home that day, and I said, this was one of the best parts of my week, empowering people that feel shut off to be connected to a community by people showing up in their lives. And then... And then relationally, they're showing up differently online and caring for the other people that are online. And so it's like a, it's, it's like a, a wave, right? It, one affects another. And what I love is I have a colleague who totally embraces that. She is not worried about her being seen as the pastor, best preacher, best teacher, best person overseeing it. It's really been an empowering model of ministry. And this congregation gets it and they're equipping others to do it. And so part of the thing for me is I get the initial thing. Hey, I went to seminary. I want to do this. I have gifts in this. But I want to say when you step back and start empowering other people, even if it feels awkward, the ripple effect and the more impact that that can have is just so affirming. And 
I don't need to be in the limelight. I kind of like being in the background. And so part of what's fun is to say they don't even know that these three people empowered that person, but that person is the one getting the credit or, or is being seen. So I think this is a challenge for the way we've trained leaders, mm-hmm. but living into this shift is so exciting and I love when now they're telling us, hey, we've been doing these ministry on the side, and we just thought we maybe should inform you pastors. I'm like, oh, that's nice. Thank you. Thanks. You know? <laughs> yes. So I just would wonder, have you guys seen other models of how this has happened, uh, either in uh, in the conversations you've had with people or the ministries you've been a part of? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I also can't help but have, uh, you know, the scripture passage in Ephesians, where really the role that of of pastor and teacher is to equip the body of Christ right into fullness and maturity in Christ and so um that's what we're called to do and um and I just I there was a pastor that a priest an episcopal priest that Dwight and I had the privilege of working with um last year and I can I remember the first time uh, that we met him and very much this posture of, okay, well, but if I'm not doing all the things, then like what am I supposed to do? I don't I don't really get it, really. Who am I? <laughs> like, I'm, yes, I'm like, literally at the yes. at the end of the day, that's the question. Yeah. Well, who am I then? Um, you know, especially like I've given my life to this. I don't this feels like you're asking me to literally become somebody else who I I don't feel like God's called me to become that person. So, um, you know, fast forward eight, nine months later, and um, I just remember the joy of John saying, um, it has been so life-giving to be able to empower other people in my congregation to try new things and to lead in ways that they've never led before. And now I don't actually even know all the things that happen at my church and I'm not leading everything. And, um, and while for some people it's going to take longer than eight or nine months to, Mm -hmm. to, to be able to reimagine their calling and how um, maybe they right were equipped to to do all the things because uh, it, depending on where you went to seminary you were equipped to do all the things and that's what you your pastoral imagination was shaped in that way and so to do anything but that feels um, you know contradictory to to how you're trained and and um, how you've imagined pastoral ministry um, but we've seen so many people really lean into that own their own personal transformation of seeing their calling as even more full uh, a fuller sense of calling than simply preaching and teaching and doing all the things but actually equipping other people to do it and empowering them to do it and seeing the life um the the fullness of life that they're stepping into is so refreshing and encouraging for pastors when they are able to just give up something you know it doesn't have to be all the things um but to allow other people to step into that into their calling in christ church um is usually way more life-giving than not well and it's an invitation for pastors to reflect on what does this community really need me to do so if there's no equipping taking place Mm -hmm. if there's no one um, who's really functioning as a uh, a, a cultivator of theological interpretation, right, of helping the community make Christian meaning out of their experience, um, you know, then it's unlikely those things are going to happen. Like, So there are some very particular things. And if you have the blessing of a theological education and, and you are uh, have been able to go deep into the tradition, that is such an essential thing to open up and share with people, not as someone who has a monopoly on it, <laughs> but really as someone who's there as um, as a steward of it, um, as Jesus talks about in in Matthew's gospel of you know f- um, the scribe kind of pulling out treasures new and old right um, out of the tradition and so so there's some really key things to do and Eugene Peterson published a book many years ago a fun book called the Unnecessary Pastor <laughs> I remember reading that in seminary and trying to imagine like what is he talking about uh, but but really it's a book about um, you know, how does the pastor primarily be a person of prayer and spiritual leadership and then really kind of giving away ministry in all the different ways that it can be given away with appropriate equipping, accountability, things like that, and support, encouragement, um, 
but to get super clear. And I think the other side to that, of course, is that for most pastors, that's not a conversation they can have by themselves. It's also a conversation with the congregation because there are expectations then that need to be renegotiated. So if you say, I'm not going to come to any committee meetings or I'm not going to be at this, that, or the other, um, and the tradition has been the pastor's there and at, at the center of it, then you're going to disappoint expectations. And that needs to be handled you know, in a gentle way, a careful way, um, so that um, people aren't um, – well, first of all, so you don't lose influence, so you don't lose in leadership, mm -hmm. and people just say, "Well, what are you doing? We're not going to. We don't want you as our pastor anymore. We're going to stop paying you. We're going to fire you." And so, so, so that that art of disappointing expectations at a rate that people can stand, which Ron Heifetz talks about, is really important for this kind of journey. How do you have those good conversations around? First of all, biblically, theologically, as the body of Christ, we have many gifts, um, and leaders are. Leaders with different gifts are animated by God, by the Spirit, to bring the whole body to, to maturity. And, um, and that's just not the model from Christendom that the church has inherited. And, um, and we need to reclaim, I think, those biblical models much more. Well, and I think as <clears throat> um, really the church culture became what it, what, it, what it has been and what we're kind of um, moving out of, but you were started right like now you have a building you have to manage you have a budget you have to manage you were called to be an accountant a building manager like all the things and um for the majority and by majority i mean the vast majority of people those are not actually in your gift mix anyway and that that isn't naturally what you're gifted to do there sure there may be a few people but but that isn't what god necessarily called called most pastors to do to wear, you know, five different hats. And so, um, I don't know, personally, I love being able to, to find people who are better than me at doing things and then equipping and empowering them to do it because now everybody benefits. It's a win-win. Um, it's not something I'm particularly gifted at, but somebody else is, and they're going to be able to do with it much more so than I can. Um, and everybody wins when that happens. You brought up adaptive leadership, and I was thinking about being on the dance floor and being on the balcony. Mm -hmm. And I think we have often imagined our role is to be on the dance floor doing all these things of a community of discipleship. When I, and I, when I wonder if this time and place we're being called to more often get up on the balcony and say, how is this being a culture of discipleship, a community, uh, cultivating a spiritual community that's empowering each other, living out the gifts, um, wondering what does it mean to make spiritual meaning of our lives through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, yeah, that happens through preaching and teaching and care. But we have so reduced it to I'm teaching Bible studies on Tuesday night rather than, hey, getting up on the balcony and say, how might we do this together and being a uh, someone that's leading a culture of that, it's embedding that in the DNA. And so I want to encourage people to say, look at your balcony time versus your dance floor time. Mm -hmm. And what's the right balance for that congregation in that time and place? And make sure there's some mix mm -hmm. of that. Okay, well, question number four what do I do when people in my congregation are at odds with one another and with me? This is an election year when American society seems more divided than ever. How on earth do I lead in this environment? Hmm. Yep. <laughs> Thoughts. Like, this is the, the question for 2024. I yeah. think yeah. so many of us are facing. Um, so I, a couple just observations I would make. First is that um, you know, politics is the new religion in America. So politics and political identities and tribalism is functioning religiously. It, it has the same um, purpose that religion has in people's lives as a way of uh, ident forming identity, mm -hmm. meaning, um, all kinds of things around purity mm -hmm. and, you know, um, belonging and shame and, you know, righteousness, like so many of those religious impulses are being worked out in the political sphere rather than um, the actual religious sphere. <clears throat> and so, so it's important to name that, like we're dealing with a cultural phenomenon as religion 
has receded in American society and American culture. It's being replaced by politics, among other things, with a kind of fervor and a kind of ultimate you know, meaning, ultimate concern, to use Paul Tillich's old phrase, right, for faith. It, like, it is a matter of more important faith than actual Christian faith. Um, so often, I mean, you know, a lot of, you know, a huge number of people who describe themselves as evangelicals, for instance, just never go to church. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just kind of this generic, you know, identity, cultural identity, political mm -hmm. identity. So, um, so that being the case, like this is a bigger challenge than we might recognize it to be, because what you're actually um, negotiating with or addressing is very deep questions of ultimate meaning and identity that are not easily given up mm -hmm. or, um, or, you know, reconciled, if you will. So that being said, the, uh, the invitation for us is to have a theological response and a practical response. And the theological response has to be that we understand the body of Christ as a community of unity without uniformity and difference without division, mm -hmm. that deep in what it means to be joined in Christ is actually this coming together across all kinds of secondary creaturely or cultural identities. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, just think about Paul, because in Christ, you know, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, et cetera, Republican nor Democrat, whatever we might say, cons liberal conservative in today's world. In other words, those identities don't go away, but they're penultimate. Mm -hmm. So, I think the places where this is most powerful are places where that primary Christian identity is not functioning as the organizing, animating identity of the local church. I, so there are other things that are filling that, um, and that makes it very hard. Um, but we need to—we actually need to go deeper into the gospel in this sense and be more theological and recognize how the Holy Spirit, throughout the biblical witness and throughout church history breaks down walls mm -hmm. and unites people without enforcing a kind of cultural um, or creaturely uniformity of where everyone has to think alike or be exactly the same in order to be joined in Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. So one of the things I think on the practical side, to pick up that part, I think in general, we lack practices and experience to be in community across difference. I think of how many families no longer can just sit at a table and talk about difference mm -hmm. or stay in relationship, deep relationship across difference. I think of we have found our friends or our neighbors kind of going to more homogenous rather than, you know, kind of among difference, mm -hmm. right? And so I think one of the things that I would really encourage congregations that aren't in deep conflict to begin to hold conversations and, and develop some practices about what we what might we believe about certain things that we might differ on and mm -hmm. and introduce some practices around tables and listening to each other telling stories seeing the complexities in each other's lives it's really easy i think to flatten people's understanding of each other and to say oh i know who you are i think one of the the tensions that i see in communities that I've been a part of if I know one part of your story and I think I know the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But when I sit down and talk with you, I realize you're way more complicated than that and way more richer than that one thing. And so telling stories and having practices to talk about ideas, topics that we might have difference on are muscles we can develop. In, in And I think congregations are one place I have hope that can do this more than others if if we lean into this theological understanding and if we and we don't start in the middle of the hot topics, but we start off on like what's your view of church and how has it been helpful and painful, right? Like there's all kinds of things we could start at different things to just put ourselves in conversations um, that could help us learn how to do this. What do you think, Alicia? Well, <clears throat> I can't help but uh, think back to, so I was trying to do the math in my head. Um, well, probably was about less than 20 years ago now, but closer to 20 than I 
can believe, actually. Uh, this is probably 18, 19 years ago or so, thereabouts, um, that I was asked to run for office and a uh, local office here in Minnesota. And uh, I was working at a church at the time. And I, I wasn't interested for a number of reasons. But one one of the primary reasons that I said no was actually because as a pastor, I didn't want to limit the number of people um, that I could minister to and with. And I had zero interest in people knowing my political views um, because I didn't want that to to become a stumbling block for someone with whom we might not share the same political views. And frankly, I don't really care. Um, I want us to be able to come together, talk about Jesus, worship together, and um, and and so to now, I'm just, so thinking about that. So okay, it's about 20 years ago now, um, <laughs> and a lot has changed. Um, the three of us were in a conversation with Trip Fuller earlier this week, and one of the things that Trip brought up, and I, I'm just curious um, what both of you think about this. But one of the things Trip um, said was that if what he's finding as he's talking with um, with pastors in different congregations is that if um, if pastors say something political or seemingly political, they'll lose half their church. If they stay silent, nobody new walks through their doors. Like to your point, Dwight, that the before we want to have a conversation about Jesus, we want to know what your political views are. Like, where do you stand? Because that's going to tell me a lot about whether I like you, your family, your church, your neighborhood, your community, all the things. Um, and so, you know, to me, that's in such stark contrast than 20 years ago where, I mean, I didn't think anything of saying no because I didn't want to limit my sphere of influence as a as a pastor because I want to be able to minister to whomever. I don't your political views we ha- yes, we all have them. I don't need to know them all, though, you know, and I don't need you to know mine for us to to be able to have a relationship, especially a relationship around Jesus. Um, so there to me, the pendulum has swung very far. And so I'm I'm curious what what the two of you thought when when Tripp shared that. Well, what it, it brings to mind for me is, um, you know, something that happened, I think, in the American church in the 20th century as um there was more secularization in society. And, you know, so you think about coming out of the world wars. On the one hand, there was a lot of coming together after World War II and people joined congregations and all kinds of voluntary associations in the church that was on one hand thriving institutionally. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was really, I think, about Mm -hmm. civic and social and cultural connection. And so starting in the 60s, when a lot of churches went more into crisis, particularly those coming out of the mainline. I think the response was by many churches and pastors was in order to be relevant in society, we are going to um, adopt, you know, more explicit political um, orientation, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to be more politically active activists. And again, there's political struggles that, you know, the church should engage and certainly mm-hmm. civil rights was one of those and all of that. Um, but part of the outgrowth of that was it was a it was a solution for some churches to a larger identity crisis. Um, and, you know, both embracing political activism, both I think in the on the left, particularly in the 60s and later, and then on the on the right with the moral majority and the religious right starting in the 1980s um, and on to this day, um, where that that vacuum, if you will, of that identity crisis for the church gets filled with politics. And then um, it's very easy for people to feel like, well, that's the purpose of what we're, that's, that's the animating energy, again, that's right. that we're organized around. And so that being the case, um, I think this is a moment to actually do deeper thinking and praying and discerning and conversation together as the church around what does it mean to be church in in this kind of society in this moment. And you can't assume that we know that clearly, I think. Um, And for generations where the answer was, well, we're politically relevant or active, um, you don't need church for that anymore. So what you have is this strange thing of um, where you have, you know, churches that that have a primarily social and political identity and um, people who are actually really committed to following Jesus 
just bailing out of institutional churches without leaving their faith in, in Christ because they don't feel like those structures are actually helping them do that in daily life. Mm -hmm. And um, and so so this it, it's an identity crisis. There are deep questions of ecclesiology, and these are being quest questions that are being asked on across the spectrum. Mainline evangelicals are having this conversation in some really interesting ways right now as well. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, as you were talking about identity, one of the things that's been interesting in a variety of conversations, and many of them are with our seminarians, is if I theologically believe everyone's a child of God, what does that mean? What does that mean to the person that has an extremely different political or religious view than I do? What does it mean to... Um, to the person in my congregation that's been incarcerated. And when I preach, I'm, and I imagine he's going to be in the third row, I have to think about text differently. I preached last year on Martin Luther King weekend, and uh, it so happened that I'm talking about slavery, and I, I brought it into the sermon because I'm like, okay, do, I, I can't ignore it. It's in the text. It's the weekend around us, and the it's the one weekend that somebody from our congregation who's married an African shows up, which isn't always there. And I'm like, and hit and their children, and and I'm like, how are they hearing this text? Because it was his people that were slaved that were taken from the, like from his country. Like I start thinking about all of these things. So I think about what if everyone's a beloved child of God, and I don't know how to love all my neighbors that God has called me to love. And to say out loud, there are some that I just gravitate towards and there are others I struggle, right? And to begin to think through these differences in what God has called us to do, the vision of God's beloved kingdom, of God's beloved community, and how far I am from that today, mm -hmm. and what are the places, and what are the places we're called to face, um, I, re I mean, we're we're in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and those months after George Floyd's murders, murder and the what it meant to be community, and that it was so, so in my being, mm -hmm. right? Like, how do we not just gloss over the pain, but actually kind of move into the uncomfortableness with regard to that, and say, what does my faith actually call me to? In this time, and both us, the collective us, and the me, uh, me mm -hmm. as a person in this time and place. So, part of what I think is, I gotta quit generalizing. I gotta quit saying it's your fault. I gotta quit expecting government to fix it, or the churchwide expression of, or you know, the whatever to make the declaration and everybody get in line. Mm -hmm. I gotta make it mine. I got to live within the tensions that are whatever's in front of me. And I got to put one foot in front of the other and keep showing up mm -hmm. um, in, in, some, in some vulnerable ways, but in some, God, this is your mission. This is your vision. How are we called in this time? So a couple of things I'm hearing in this conversation, I just want to note. Um, one is we have theological work to do with the church, right? Around what does it mean to follow Jesus? Yeah. Um, both the left and the right um, in American society right now are, t are tending to operate with certain assumptions about human nature, mm -hmm. whether it be a kind of left-wing progressive assumption coming out of Jean-Jacques Rousseau that human nature is good and we just need to you know, actualize ourselves fully without any constraints, or a kind of Nietzschean version of that on the right, a will to power version of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to step into those debates and say, actually, you know, the Christian theological tradition would not agree that human nature is good. Actually, it's deeply flawed and, and broken, and we need to be delivered from a power beyond us. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be a strongman leader or some political cause, mm -hmm. whether on the left or the right. It's actually um, a, a, a suffering servant savior on, on the cross. Mm -hmm. And 
So we so get more theological. I think <laughs> find the practices in your community that you can build on things that people are used to doing. Like Terry, you mentioned breaking bread together, having right. meals, yeah. right? And then Sharing finding stories. ways to share mm-hmm. stories, mm-hmm. right? And yep. um, I'm thinking about there's a wonderful book by Amanda Ripley called High Conflict that has some stories of communities. In this case, it was a um, a Jewish community, a, a congregation in New York City that was very progressive pairing up with a conservative evangelical congregation in rural Michigan. Wow. And they actually did the, a practice of pilgrimage where they went, teams from each went and spent time and lived with each other mm-hmm. and were hosted in each other's spaces. And it really messed with everyone involved because <laughs> it really broke down. It broke down all the stereotypes. Um, you know, they're still who they are and they got transformed. And so what are practices of pilgrimage, storytelling, um, relocation, right, in order to understand? And then um, let's blame less. Let's blame less. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, a covenant church, Emmanuel Covenant in Shoreview, Minnesota, that's um, that's creating a whole thing called the Blame Less Project, <laughs> right? Because we we we're so inclined to just blame each other. It's not blame never, but there are times to blame. But just the propensity just to blame each other is is really toxic, and it's feeding a lot of toxicity. So, um, and and then I think we have to have the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to I was, deliver I us. I was just going to say, <laughs> and and I think the other piece that I've heard in our thread through today is, and make room for and be alert to where's the Spirit moving among us? Where's the Spirit asking us to lay stuff down? Where's the Spirit inviting us to wonder and be creative? Where's the Spirit calling us to rest and to lean into God's love and grace as opposed to our own doing? Yeah, we can't do it on our own. It's very evident uh, that it is actually it takes a lot of intentionality, right? Because left to our own devices, well, we have a, a good glimpse right now of what that leads to. And it's not life-giving to people. I mean, I just was on a call earlier today with a, a ministry leader in, in California, and we were just talking about how just it was almost as if when January 1, 2024, uh, you know, the date turned, um, there was this collective posture of like leaning back and waiting because yeah. everyone knows that this is an election year and people are tired yep. and we the you know the collective majority really would rather okay we have to find a better way forward right. because this is not working and i don't want to relive the last yeah. election in my community with my family right um i mean families are torn apart and still you know are are really struggling and so um there has to be a better way but it's it's not going to be in our own accord I mean, the Holy Spirit has to has to be part of the work within us and within us collectively. So two things, as you were saying, I, the difference for me about 2024 going into this election year is in the last round of time, I've been really hopeful at different times that we'd figure it out and we haven't mm-hmm. politically. Yes. Right. Like I've been disappointed and disappointed and disappointed. And I, I'm not going to put my hope there anymore. But it was also interesting. One of the practices um, our colleague and I teaches, Chris Stash teaches at another seminary. And we were both kind of overwhelmed with some things during as we were going up to an election uh, one of these past years. And we gathered a group of women and said, what's one thing we can do? And we gathered for half an hour. Um, once a week and prayed together. We we had a text, same text every week. We read that text together and then we brought each other's concerns and we prayed for each other. And if there was one life-giving practice that saved me through that period, it was finding some other people to lean in and to just invite the Spirit. So one of the things I want to leave our listeners with is if you don't have some colleagues to gather, to pray, to support each other, to walk with in this, find some, even one. And now with our digital tools, we can do it online. We, there's a whole variety of ways that we can do that. But I think each of these questions says lean into community, don't separate from. Absolutely. 
And so, you know, those of you who are out listening, if you have ideas for um, things that you'd like us to address on the Pivot Podcast, we would love to hear from you. Um, our email address is in the show notes, or you can just send an email to Faith lead at luthersem.edu. And we're going to be looking to make some offerings this year um, to really support ministry leaders who are trying to navigate this really kind of treacherous political season that we're in in our society. So stay tuned for that. Um, And thank you so much for joining us today. In our next episode, we're going to continue to explore the key pivots the church needs to make. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.